just having conversations without any mind to her. Little did we know, about 10 minutes into it, she got up and walked and started playing on the swings, but we were still in the sandbox just digging and playing, and all the people passing by were just curious why two adults were sitting in the sandbox just playing by themselves. Um, <laughs> it's very easy to get caught up in activities and forget your original purpose. If you're not careful, what began as a good thing with a well-defined purpose drifts into something that looks almost as ridiculous as two grown-ups playing in a sandbox together. And so it's good from time to time for us to review the overall purpose of the church and to evaluate all of our activities and efforts in light of that purpose. Some of you are brand new to the church. Some of you have probably been coming. Uh, a lot of you have been coming for maybe even less than a year. And so we are so grateful that you're part of our church. My, me and my wife, well, my wife was here as an international student when we got married in 2003. And when I moved down here, we were part of an Indian church. Um, and one of the burdens that God laid on my heart was that so many of the young people in that church didn't know the word. They were just simply going to church and sitting on their phones and then leaving. And so God laid on my heart to start a Bible study in our house simply for the guys at that church. And so Thursday nights, a group of five or six high school students would come to my house and we would just open up scripture. I think we spent like a year and a half on the book of Galatians, just going verse by verse. And these high school kids loved it. They kept coming back week in and week out. And we said, hey, let's call it a name. And so someone came up with the idea Loft. And so we called it Loft. And that's all we ever thought we would be. We thought we'd be a Bible study that encourages young people to study God's Word together. So things were going well at the church, and things were going well at the Bible study. And all of a sudden, in 2006, everything went into a downward spiral, and um, we were basically forced out of the church, even though we left. We left, but it was basically forced out, and um, things just went from up here to down there, and didn't know what God was calling us to do. And at that moment in time, we actually wondered if we were even wanting to continue in ministry, wanting to continue um, doing anything. I think we had conversations at home, we'll just find a church somewhere, give our tithes, go back home, but not get actively involved. And, but the folks, the youth in the church were like, hey, we need to continue this Bible study. We'll still come, even if you're not a part of the church. And so the guy, one of the guys that were there, so we started talking, planning, praying, um, and we actually wrestled with moving it to a central location and moved it to Richardson. Same shopping center, Calvary Bible Church, just a couple storefronts down. Started meeting there in March um, of 2007 on Sunday nights. And we met Sunday nights for about three years, and it just started growing. We started seeing so many people come. We started seeing college students come. We got connected with InterVarsity at UTD. We started um, seeing so many folks just starting to come and attend. And about three years into it, um, we started wrestling with, are we a Bible study? Are we a church? Um, and I'll be honest, I think everyone else was like, we're a church? And I was like, no, we're a Bible study. I don't want to be a church. Church is a headache. And, um, and we wrestled with that. And so we wrestled with that for about a year. Um, and then in 2010, we really felt that God was calling us to transition from a Bible study to a church. And we looked and began to study the demographics of our community and realized that there's so many people in Richardson that are de-churched, um, that used to be in church, but then they got burned by church and left. And for them, in their mind, church was Sunday morning. And so we wrestled with transitioning from Sunday night to Sunday morning. And around all that time, this facility opened up. Um, it was already a church, but it was just tiles. Um, I think there was a stage, but it was like a beat, broken down stage. Um, and we just jumped on it, got it, um, and in March of 2011, we began Sunday morning services. At the peak on Sunday nights, we were averaging about anywhere between 80 to 100 people. We were packing that sanctuary out. 
when we started Sunday morning, our first service, we had no space in here. We, we were trying to find seats. We had people sitting on, on the floor. It was amazing. I mean, we were like, oh, this is good. Second week, there was 20 people here. Third week, there was 20 people here. For the first two years, there was an average of about 20 people here. At the end of 2012, um, I debated on whether God was just calling me to start this church and maybe someone else was supposed to lead it. And we started wrestling with the idea of transitioning out, possibly even moving overseas to do some missions work and just started praying and wrestling with it. And at that same time, God just started dealing with my heart of like, this is not your church, this is my church. And really started pulling the grips, my grips off this church. And at that point, 2013, we saw a young lady by the name of Siklali come and join our church. And it was like the gospel light bulb clicked for her. Um, she got saved, got baptized, she started bringing people left and right. Every day, every week, I'd pick her up from UTD, and she'd like have three new people with her. I was like, and some of them would stick around, some of them wouldn't. And we went from one nationality in the end of 2012, or two nationalities. Daryl was with us. Praise the Lord for Daryl. Um, <laughs> and so uh, almost two nationalities to now, last I counted, there's like 15, 16, some nationalities represented. We've grown a lot over the last two years, and um, it's been exciting to see what God has been doing. When we began as a Bible study, it was a concern that the Word of God wasn't being taught. My passion was that the Word would be taught, the Word would transform lives, and that um, people would be passionate about Jesus. That's how Loft began. Listen, one of the things we will always be committed to is that we will be a ministry that is centered on the unchanging, never failing, life transforming word of God. We will be committed to that. You will hear messages here week in and week out that will push you, that will challenge you to follow Jesus. So as I talk about our DNA and I share this, let me share a couple things about what I don't think we are as a church before we begin. One, I don't think you should expect to come here regularly to church just one day a week, get what you want for your own personal growth and development, and then leave till next Sunday. We are not a motivational group. Some of this is what I am praying for as a a church. This is my hope that this is what we will be. My prayer is that you would die to yourselves, to your desires that you will live in complete surrender to God. We are not interested in you checking off a box that said you went to church on Sunday morning. It's very easy to grow a church. There's enough manuals and strategies of church growth that we could use. All we need to do is have short messages that make you feel good and make you laugh, great music, short services, and then That would be it. We've tried that in our society, and we have churches that are full of people that come on Sunday, but yet don't resemble the one that they worship in their lives. Listen, as our leadership, we want so much deeper for you. We want you to be grounded in Jesus. We want your lives to be transformed by the Word of God. We will go deep into Scripture. We will get in your face about how you live. We will address issues that are a lot of churches might not address. We will talk about things that are uncomfortable because we want you to follow Jesus with all your life. We want you to become disciples of Jesus. Second, it is my prayer that you would not be anonymous in this church, unknown and able to disappear whenever you want. Let me be honest. If you don't feel connected, I don't know what to tell you. We have to make the effort to do that together. We as a church bear a lot of that burden on trying to connect with you, but you also need to make the effort to connect with people. You can't just come in and disappear and no one knows you, no one knows your story, no one knows your life. That's not what we're called to be. We're called to be family. We're not just church members who just gather and leave. 
with family. That means that you need to invest into the lives of people around you. Listen, if there's people in this church that have been coming here for years and you haven't connected with them, you need to check your hearts of why you're not connecting with people around you. Number three, you shouldn't expect a show or a production here. I love our worship. I think our guys do a phenomenal job. Even George with all of his Israeli music that he does every once in a while. Um, it is phenomenal. We do great stuff. We're back into making videos again. It's exciting. We believe in excellence as a church. But we're not a show. We don't want you to come here and say, man, they did a great job today. Or they preached a great sermon today. That's not our expectation. Our prayer is that you would come in here and you would say, man, Jesus was in this place. He was dealing with my heart. He was convicting me of sins and calling me to live a different life. He was encouraging me to pursue him in new ways. We don't want to be performance-based. We will strive to do everything we do with excellence, but that's not our goal. So we'll start late. We might end late. We might mess up. Guitar strings might break. I might mess up on words up here, which happens a lot. Um, apparently, I mess up on a bunch of Hebrew words. Our Hebrew critic over there lets me know every single week that I mess up. But we're not a production. Don't come in here looking for a show. This is not the people up here are worshiping and you're watching. These are lead worshipers who are pointing you to worship Jesus. It is you worshiping Jesus together. Can I also say you shouldn't come here expecting to feel good and ecstatic after each service. Sometimes there will be times when you're called to repent, times when you're called to lament, times where you're called to weep and self-examine yourself. And there might be even times where you're just called to be silent. And there will be times where you rejoice and celebrate and worship God. Our goal is not to make you happy, but our goal is to be a means through which God will make you holy. You shouldn't expect to hear a lot of sermons here that promise you that God will prosper you with the life you've always wanted if you would just believe in him or step out in faith or if you would just give some money so that we could have a bigger sanctuary or heat that works or whatever. You should, you should expect to hear sermons that call you to radical living for Jesus, sacrificially giving of your time and money not to get something from God, but in obedience to Jesus. Now those of you who are expecting us to be a megachurch, that's not going to happen. Let me be honest. I don't want it. It's not my desire. We're not going to be a mega church. I truly believe that as a pastor, I am not a speaker that speaks into your life. I want to know you. My capacity is a max of 150 people. That's all I can handle. And at that point, I'm not going to um, start multiple, multiple services. But you should expect us to hear us start talking about, as we grow, planting a second church. That's something we are already having conversations about, praying about, because pastors should be able to know their sheep. And I want to be able to know you guys and pour into you guys and love you guys and encourage you guys. And so you shouldn't expect that from us. That means you shouldn't expect what you see in a mega church. You shouldn't expect that here. When we first started, I had had guys come in here and say, well, so-and-so church has this and that and this and that. And I was like, well, so-and-so church has millions of dollars and millions of people and thousands of resources. We have 20 people. And half of them have kids, and they don't have time to be here. We're not a mega church, and we're not going to have a million programs. We're going to pour into your lives so that you can grow, but we're not going to consume your lives. You shouldn't expect to hear arguments here over style of music color of the carpet, yes, it's getting dirty, um, or even doctrinal issues. That's not what we're called to do. You should expect that mission should drive our conversation. We want this church body to be a community 
that's centered on the heartbeat of God, seeing people come into his kingdom, being changed by his spirit, falling in love with his son, and living lives for his glory. I touched on this earlier, but you should not expect community to come to you. True community in Christ will take some effort and a reshuffling of priorities for you. I know that you want people to come out to you and reach out to you, and I know that you're hurting and you're busy and you don't have time. I understand that, but assuming that you are a follower of Jesus, you must learn that the answer to all of those things is to enter into the practice of being the body of Christ, including sitting, eating, sharing, praying, and living together. That's what we're called to do. You can't just expect community to show up to you all the time. And finally, you shouldn't expect a church that creates as many program, creates so many programs that we keep you isolated from the world. We don't want to take you out of the world. We want to empower you so that you can live for Jesus in the world. So don't expect a lot of programs. Our community groups on that meet in the week are just so that we can encourage one another. Our Sunday morning worship is so that we can study God's word together. Our Bible studies are so we can just pray for one another. That's all we, all we really have. And that's all I think we will have. Because we want you to be engaged in your schools, in your jobs, with your families, loving them through Jesus. So that's what we are. The DNA of Loft is very simple. You see it on the lobby wall every single time that you walk in. It's these words, living our faith together. <laughs> it's not deep. It's not profound. We at Loft City Church are a community that is living our faith together. It's that simple, four words. But yet, as we unpack each of those words this morning, you'll see that it's much deeper than that. This isn't just our DNA, it's our dream, our hope of what we would like to be as a church. By the way, if Loft is in your home church, or if you're visiting, or even if you are a part of this church, this isn't just what our church is about, this is what you're called to be as well. And so I'm going to unpack these words, and these things that I'm going to mention are for our everyday life. The first word in our DNA is that word living. Defined as something that is life, active, or thriving, growing, strong, flowing freely, a particular manner, state, or status of life. We believe that being a follower of Jesus or a Christian is much more than a label or identification. It's a way or a manner of life, a pattern that's integrated into everyday life, not because we have to, but because we get to. Not so much out of religious compulsion, but compelled by a love for God and for people. Our lives are lived in such a way that bring glory to God and draw people to God. One that grasps that we, grasps that we are part of God's bigger story in, big, in redemption history. And we're willing to give ourselves to be the best that we can be in that story. One that believes that their lives are meant for something bigger than fame and wealth and power, but it is one that is called to live on mission. One that understands that being a Christian doesn't mean we do more in the church and serve the church, but that we are called to be the church. Love is what a disciple of Jesus should be known for. And here is how it's lived out. Let me give you some rhythms that we'll talk about. It means that we are sent. Jesus sent us out on mission into culture to be salt and light everywhere we go. In this sense, we are missionaries wherever we are. You teachers are missionaries in your schools. You doctors are missionaries in your practice. You students are missionaries on your campus. You're sent. Secondly, it means we eat. We choose not to waste our meals. I just finished a book that George recommended called Meals with Jesus. It talks about the significant conversations that Jesus had in his ministry were over a meal. Grace was offered over a meal. Forgiveness was offered over a meal. We choose not to waste our meals. We seek to commune with others as often as possible, and we view each meal as a blessing from God. We realize that some sacred moments happen over the sharing of a meal together as lives are open and shared in ministry 
begins to happen. Third, it means that we are a presence in society. We don't believe that we're created to be a subculture. Instead, that we're called to dwell within culture in order to influence it, shape it, and redeem it for God. We believe that this whole world and everything in this world belongs to God. Like Jesus, we choose to enter the story in order to change the story. Next, it means we listen. We are charged by God to love him and our neighbors as ourselves. One tangible way of loving is listening. We'll take opportunities to hear the stories of others, to rejoice when, with those who rejoice, to weep with those who weep. Not only do we listen to each other, but we will listen for God. And we will choose deliberate moments of silence and quiet our hearts before our Creator. Next, it means we party. Barbecues. Inviting people into our homes. Being involved in sports and activities that are fun and non-religious. These are just a few examples of what it means to party, to choose to celebrate and enjoy life with people instead of just inside of our own church community. This is what Jesus did. He celebrated. He had three years on this earth, but you find him at a wedding. You find him sharing meals at parties. We celebrate with people. That means we bless. We are blessed by God to be a blessing to others. This can come in various forms. Maybe it's an encouraging email, or a kind word, or an unselfish act, or a helping hand, or inviting someone to lunch after service. Wherever your imagination takes you, being a blessing means making deposits into the lives of people around you. Showing grace is to do whatever someone, showing grace is to do so whether someone deserves it or not we will look to tangibly bless others. We're called to live our faith together. The second word in our DNA is living our, the word our. That word our is very simple, and yet it's so complex. See, it's easy for us to define our as people that look like us, behave like us, believe like us, and belong in the same economic class as us. Yet God defines the word our as the entire world. The gospel is not excluded from one person or one group. However, as a local church, we can put some clearer definition of what that looks like to us. See, it's our firm belief that God has put us in Richardson for a bigger purpose than to simply be a church that meets in Richardson. See, while we have people that come from various parts of the city, there's a reason why God has put us in this city at this time. When we say our, that means we see all people as created in the image of God and long for them to worship God in spirit and in truth. What does that look like? That means we have compassion. Matthew 9 states that when Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. Jesus saw the crowd and stepped into their story and spoke directly to them. He didn't simply speak at them. Who are these faces that we're called to see? Some of them are faces that already know their stories. Some are faces that we care about. Some are faces that are exploring Jesus and looking for answers. Some are prodigals. Some have suffered great heartache and pain due to broken relationships. Some are giving love one last shot. Some have no clue how they're going to pay their bills this week. Some will blow their excess on a shopping spree on things that they don't need. Some are drowning in confusion about their future. Some know full well what they're supposed to do, but they don't have the courage to do it. Some have been neglected by those that they love. Some are neglecting the ones that they love. Some are oblivious to their own self-righteousness. Some can't even see their own depravity. Some are theological snobs who think they know it all. Some have never even touched scripture even once. 
Some are recovering from addictions. Some are denying they have addictions. Some feel overwhelmed in life. Some feel that their life is empty. Some desperately need the gospel. Some desperately re- need to be reminded of the gospel. To these, we as a church are called to be compassionate. To these, we're called to be compassionate. This also means we include. The arm of God is big enough to wrap the entire world. The least that you and I can do is wrap our arms around our neighbor, the people that we come into contact with every day. We will not play favorites based on social status, but we will view all people as equally valuable under Almighty God. Our community is one where people can belong before they believe and find grace overflowing in their lives. All are welcome to this table. This includes the college student community at UTD and Richland and SMU and um, DTS. This involves Camelot and Bell Grove. This includes the young college graduates who are now working This includes families where both parents are there or where families where it's just a single parent there. It includes the elderly that are living in retiring communities. It fuels anyone whom God is calling. It includes Richardson, a city that will have a population over 110,000 people by the year 2020, a city where 20% of the population of this city is foreign-born. They're immigrants. They've just moved here. A city where 30% of the population do not speak English as their number one language in their home. A city where 18% of the population is within the age bracket of 18 to 34 trying to figure out what to do with life. A city that is actually considered the second best place to raise kids by Texas Business Week. But yet almost 10% of the city live in poverty a city that has a college campus of over 15,000 students, of which 15% of them are international students living in a brand new world. A city where there's only one church for every 1,200 people. This is where we're called to. This is who we're called to love. It includes having a global vision to, to send people to where God is calling them to go. That might mean sending students to serve in the summer with ministries like InterVarsity. It might mean we begin to start organizing mission trips again as a church and serving. It is not segregated by race, gender, or social economics. It is something that needs to happen top down, beginning with leadership. Those of you who are married, it means investing in the college students in our community. Those of you who are in college, it means going and talking to married folks and getting to know them. We need to be intentional of getting out of our comfort zones and truly living our faith together. This is what it means to say, our. The third word in our DNA is the word faith. One dictionary defines faith as loyalty and allegiance to a person or a thing. At Loft, can I unashamedly say we are about Jesus. We will always be about Jesus. In him, God became a man, entered our messed up stories, and changed our stories. He died for us so that we could live for him. And as a result of what Jesus did and is doing, our hope is to be the church that God had in mind. Not some religious institution or self-righteous, hypocritical, judgmental hypocrites, but a movement of love, of messed up, yet growing people who are exploring and following Jesus together people who are taking first steps and next steps and living the life they are meant to live, a people who are an authentic community of grace, truth, mission, and meaning. Our styles and our methods may not be typical, but Loft is all about, all for, and all because of Jesus. To him, we will give our loyalty and our allegiance, and because of that, we strive to be a church that embraces a biblical worldview wherever God places us in life. We believe in the timeless truths of God's word. We aren't looking for new teachings or new doctrines or new ideas or new religion. We aren't looking simply to memorize and get popped up in scripture. We absolutely believe that this word is relevant to our lives and is still changing people today. 
And since Jesus said it is all about him, we recalibrate our lives in accordance to what he wants for us. It is our supreme court and ultimate authority, and no person teaching or philosophy is above it. We figure if God says that, if, that this is his word to us, that that should be a big deal for us. It is in the Bible that we discover the truth of the gospel. It is there that we discover that in Christ we get what we don't deserve. We get Jesus and his ever-flowing, overflowing love and forgiveness to us. And because we get what we don't deserve, we are freely able to give that grace to others. What does that look like for us? It means we follow. Above all, we seek to know, love, and follow Jesus in our thoughts, our words, our actions. And every moment we look to Jesus as our great king and as our example. Following Jesus is a series of next steps, each resulting in us becoming more like him. It means we explore. To love God with all of our hearts and minds means that we are to be curious and filled with wonder at what God has revealed to us, in particularly in the scriptures, by regularly reading the Bible, studying it together, we learn what it means to live the lives that we're meant to live and we're shaped by the words of Jesus toward us. We also discover that our, about what our, we also discover about our Creator and His creation in all realms of learning, of story, of wisdom, of song, nature, imagination, and more. And yet, our highest authority is our divine conversation with Jesus through the reading of His Word. It means we grow. Growth is a natural byproduct of a healthy living thing. That includes people. Since growth comes from God, we will continually fix our eyes on Jesus, search our hearts for any cheap substitutes to him and repent of our sins and place them at the feet of our king. We will seek to live lives of health and wholeness, remembering there's one throne and one source of genuine growth. It means we pray. We will be a people of constant conversation and communion with God. As we live our lives, we will pray without ceasing according to God's will. We will thank God. We will worship God. We will be honest with God. We will confess our sins to God. We will listen to God. And we will always seek opportunities to pray for each other. Our hope is to be the go-to people for prayer in our relational networks without making a big show of it. It means we will fight. We will stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. We will fight against injustice and stand with those who are oppressed. It means that we will fight against guilt-based religion by our actions in the gospel. We agree with scripture and believe for justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream in serving others and in standing for others we serve Jesus. We will never forget that our ultimate mission is to bring the good news and be the good news to those around us. It's in our faith. It's something more than something we do. It is who we are. One final word is the word together. The dictionary defines this word as in harmony and accord, in contact with one another. At Love City, it is our firm belief that you are not called to live your faith alone, but in a sense of community. The early church did everything together. The church was more than just people who worshiped God together, but because of what Jesus did for them and what Jesus has done for us, we have been adopted as sons and daughters. Christ has become our elder brother, and we are surrounded by family members. It is God's desire that as a family we would be willing to give our lives for each other. What does that mean? This means we have relationships. We get this from God. When he created humanity, he designed us for relationship with him and one another. It is, the fab it is in the fabric of our being. This is why God is, calls us to essentially love him and his people. Our challenge is to love like God loved us. The church was never meant to be a bunch of people who sit on chairs, put on masks, and go through motions. Instead, we're called to be a family where no one is 
stands alone. Because relationships are so important, we seek less church activities and more friendships with people despite where they are on their spiritual journey. It means we share. We will seek to share our time, our talent, our treasure with each other. Generosity will flow out of the grace that God has already given us. We are to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. We will be an authentic community when we begin to share one another's burdens with a battle cry that no one in this room stands alone. This is pleasing to God, and this is a fingerprint of a true disciple. This means that we're transparent, a community that holds each other accountable, encourages each other, forgives one another, a community that's not isolated but grows stronger when they see authenticity and transparency in their midst, a place where we can be honest without fear of rejection. This means accountability. We will seek to hold each other accountable in living lives for God's glory. We will not try to hide our sins and think that it's okay, but we will find people to hold us accountable so that we live our lives for Jesus. We will not be satisfied with mediocre faith, but we will encourage each other to pursue God in complete surrender. This is what we're about as a church. This is who God has called us to be. This is our DNA, living our faith together. We don't have a long mission statement. It is living our faith together. It is something that we need to be constantly reminded of. Otherwise, it's very easy for us to lose focus. Some of you today have bought into that vision, and that's why you're here. You understand that we're not simply a church that's in this city, but we're called to be a church for this city, that God has a bigger plan and purpose for us. Many of you, this is the first time you're hearing the vision of Loft, and maybe the Holy Spirit is resonating in your heart that you need to be more deeply committed to what God is calling you to do here at this church, including of your time, your money, and your time, your money, your resources. Some of you, maybe you hear these words and you feel like, this isn't home for you. Can I be honest and say that's okay? There are so many good churches in this city. We want you to pursue Jesus where God is calling you to pursue. But if you're here, we're going to push you and challenge you on these things because these things matter to God and these things matter to us. If you're supposed to be here, the Holy Spirit will keep you here. If you're not and you end up staying here, it will be disastrous for all of us. There's one time in five years I begged someone to stay when they were called to leave. And there's, I had six months of headaches, this constant fighting, until I finally said, you know, you're not supposed to be here. I've learned my lesson and said I will never do that again. If you're called to be here, we want you here. And we want to pour into you and make you grow. Listen, as your pastor, I will be the first to admit we are far from perfect. A lot of these things that we've talked about, we haven't reached that. We haven't even gotten even close to it. But that's our hope. That's our dream. That's our map of where we want to go, where we want to be. And we want to do it together. And we want you to buy into that and say, we're doing this together. So many areas that we need improvement on, but thank God for his grace. Thank God we're making strides in the right direction. Many of us grew up in a church culture where everything revolved around the activities of the church. And as we work through some of what has been ingrained and figured out what is from God and what is not, what is, for law, what is from law and what is from not, what is from God, it's going to take time. It's going to take patience. But we're going to grow together. As we look at 2016, here's just a few of the things that God is calling us to do in this year. We're going to strengthen our missional community groups this year. We have three. We want them to grow where you are being together and just loving each other. We have opportunities for Bible studies on Mondays and Tuesdays 
and learning the word on Sunday morning. But our mission of community groups is where we want you to just party. We just want you to be around each other. We just want you to love each other, hear each other's stories. Our mission of community groups will be strengthened as you do life together. Our men's and women's Bible studies, we're going to be intentional on growing in the Word of God at a deeper level. We want to engage our city in several ways this year. We're planning a spring outreach. We've got one that's coming up in the fall. We'll do Serve Sunday again where we cancel Sunday morning service and just go serve the apartment communities. We've got a back-to-school drive for the students in our community. We've got Vacation Bible School that's already being worked on. Normally, we work on it a month in advance. This year, we're like six months in advance. They're already working on it. We're progressing. It's a miracle. Um, we're partnering with neighborhoods and ministries to be a blessing in our city. Those of you who live in Richardson, we want to hear from you of how we can bless you in reaching your neighbors for Jesus. The last Sunday of every month, we'll be having potlucks together so that we can sit and get to know each other as a church body and not form into little cliques and groups and, and never get to be community together. Every last Sunday, we'll have potlucks together. We want to help plant a church this year. When we began five years ago, two churches invested into us and said they believe in us and they poured financial resources and training into us to get started. We're five years in. We want to multiply. We have a church in mind already that we want to bless, and we are praying that we as a church would raise $3,000 to just help them get started this year so that the gospel can be heard in a community and to people that have never heard about Jesus. That's our prayer. We want to be a church that multiplies. We're working on developing a ministry internship where we invest, invest into people that want to be mentored and trained in practical ministry. We just want to pour into you guys. If you have a heart for ministry, it doesn't mean you have to be in seminary, but if you just have a heart to grow, learn how to preach a sermon or learn how to study scriptures, those kind of things, if you have a heart for that, we are developing something, um, and we want to do that for you. Like I said earlier, on those months where we have five Sundays, we're dedicating that last Sunday for a time of just worship, prayer, scripture reading, and then hearing from you, from hearing your story, so that we don't just sit and go, but we connect with one another. We want to invest into deeper relationships with our college student community. We know that we have very limited time with you. And often, what we do is, churches do is, oh, you're only here for two years or three years, and you're gone. You're not here in the long term. We don't want that to be our mentality. We want to say, God has brought you here for two years or three years, and at the end of your two or three or four years, if you do the extended five or six years, seven, whatever, you, however long you're here, at the end of that time, we want to pray over you, send you out, it, make sure you're equipped so that wherever you go, you're going on mission for Jesus. You are here for this season because God has put you here, and while you are here, we want to pour into your lives. We don't take you for granted. We don't take you lightly. We value you. And we know that as you go, a little bit of loft is going all over the world. A little bit of our DNA is going into the world. And so we take that seriously. And so we pour into you. Let me close with this. There was a Taiwanese fable about a frog who lived at the bottom of a well. When the frog was thirsty, he would drink a bit of water from the well. When he was hungry, he would eat some insects that flew just above, flew into the well. When he was tired, he would lay on a little rock at the bottom of the well, and he looked up at the sky above him. To the little frog, the sky was a small circle of blue. He was very happy, he was very satisfied, for this was the only world he ever knew. One day, a bird perched on the edge of the well, and the little frog looked up and said, Hello, why don't you come down here and play with me? It's so pleasant down here. Look, I have cool water to drink and countless number of insects to eat. Come down and join me here. But the bird responded with stories of an endless expanse of a beautiful sky. 
and the frog listened in disbelief and argued that the sky was small and round, but for he has never been outside of the well and never seen the entire sky. The bird tried to encourage the frog to get out of the well so that he could see the sky, but the frog sat on the rock, convinced that he was right. Eventually, the bird flew away in frustration, and the frog was left alone to continue pondering the little patch of sky that he could see. The story has a good ending. Eventually, a yellow sparrow swooped into the well, put the frog on its back, and flew out of the well into the sunlight. And for the first time, the frog saw flowers and trees and animals and mountains and rivers. And finally, the bird placed the frog on a lotus leaf in a beautiful pond where the frog enjoyed the rest of his days, never again to return back to his well. To the frog at the bottom of the well, the sky may only be a small circle of blue. But to a bird, the sky is vast and beautiful. And in some ways, both of them are right. This little fable is about perspective. In a world that is filled with frogs, occasionally we need to listen to the birds. We decide what kind of perspective we have. We can easily simp settle to simply coming and going week in and week out with a very limited vision, or we can choose to see that God has something so much bigger for us as a church body that is outside of these four walls and actively working in our city, and we can choose to get engaged in what God is doing. Once we've decided to move outside of the four walls of this building and begin to experience the big world of ministry, once we get to engage and what God is calling us to do, can I promise you things will never be the same. Going outside the wall is dangerous, but it's exciting. We will have to choice, we have a choice if we're going to settle at the bottom of the well or choose to soar and see the adventures that God is taking us on. Five years are done. Our future is bright. To create a different future, to create a promising future is going to take people with the vision to see, the passion to feel, and the courage to do. The people keep pushing despite inescapable squalls, adjusting the rudder and the sail as they go. Sometimes it feels like you're not making progress, but you are. You're learning. You're growing. You're becoming more useful for the kingdom. After all, you're not the captain of the ship. You're just the helmsman. You may not have the map, but you do have a compass. This is about the journey and adventure more than about the destination. This is really about the kingdom, not about programs. It's about relationships, not about numbers. It's about changed lives, not about endless activity. And as you have your mates, those kindred spirits that, that, whose heart beat with you, we have each other. Our provisions for the journey may be sparse, but you know, disciples of Jesus have the ability to create something that doesn't exist with resources that they don't have. And most of all, we have Jesus. The one that gave his life for you. The one that gave his life for your salvation. The one who we are about to celebrate when we come to the table. He's the same one who said, go into all the world. Make disciples. Teaching them all that I have taught you. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And he ends with these words, and lo, I am with you. I'm with you. See, that's what gives me hope. Not that we have great minds planning what we can do, but those four words, I am with you. I'm with you. Our hope our prayer, our confidence is that as we serve Jesus, as we love our neighbors, as we love each other, we don't go alone, but he's with you. All of these things that I said 
part of the DNA of our church is the DNA of your life. When you go to your work, he's with you. When you're with family, he's with you. When you're with people that drive you insane, he's with you. When you're having a hard day, he's with you. When you're having a good day, he's with you. You know why I know that? Every time I come to the table, it reminds me that when he shouldn't have loved me, he didn't just simply accept me, but he gave his life for me. He gave everything that he had so that I can be his and he can be mine. So this morning when we come to the table, we come acknowledging that God, there's nothing I bring. There's nothing that I have done to receive, to earn your grace and your mercy. So freely you have given it to me. When I was the worst of sinners, you have loved me and you have redeemed me and you've called me to be a part of yours. Would you take a moment? Would you examine your heart? Would you examine your life? Would you come to the table? Would you examine your attitudes, your affections, your desires? If there's anything in your life that is not from Jesus, would you repent? Would you confess? And then knowing in confidence that if you confess your sins, he is faithful to forgive, would you come to the table and celebrate the work that he has done? Celebrate Jesus this morning. Whenever you're ready, you're welcome to come. Grab a piece of bread, dip it into the juice, partake of it right there, and then you can go back to your seat. Lord Jesus, this morning as we come, we come thanking you for all that you've done for us. This is your work, not ours. And we give you the glory for it. As we come to the table, would you reveal those things in our lives that are not like you? And would you fill us more with the fruits of your spirit? We love you this morning. In Jesus' name.